the wizard by the collar and I pulled him down to me because I didn't feel like getting up. But I pulled him down to me. I said, let me tell you something. That's my partner. You touch him again and you're mine. I couldn't even stand up. <laughs> but the, wagon, the wizard said, you know who I am? I said, I don't care who you are. I said, I don't like what you did. I said, that's my partner. And uh, so anyway, things rocked on and they took us all to the hospital and nobody was killed but a bunch of broken bones, skinned knees and elbows and heads. So but, from Dr. King to the KKK, a lot happened during that time period. What did you see that most people probably didn't even know about or probably didn't even see from, from our standpoint as viewers? I saw a country that was losing at that point. Nobody was winning. When you start rioting and destroying property, both public and personal property and private property, uh, you're destroying your town. And a lot of people didn't understand that because they were too quick to riot. And uh, riot, of course, as we know, is not a way to solve anything. Um, and it's, it's just a way to destroy them and make it an excuse to steal things. Uh, so, much, so many people would use a riot as a chance to go in and get what they could get for nothing. Let's talk about some of the presidents you met, because I know you met at least one. Um, have you? <laughs> what was that like? Talk about some of those uh, personalities that you met in, um, in the Oval Office. Well, Jimmy Carter was, he was one I met, that's for sure, you know, and, and he's, he's, <laughs> he's still a good friend of mine now, although I'm, I'm not Democrat. I couldn't say that back then. <laughs> back then, I couldn't say what I was or what I wasn't, uh, and I wouldn't. I would never try to sway anybody else. But only I knew how I voted in the voting booth. And I was always happy with myself. But uh, Jimmy Carter liked to play softball. And he was good at it. And uh, he liked to win, especially with his brother being on the other team. <laughs> it all, they were very competitive. And uh, Miss Lee and their mother was always on the sideline, cheering them both on. But uh, uh, after Jimmy got into Washington, uh, Billy came, uh, called me one Fourth of July weekend, close to this weekend coming up, and he said to Clarence, he said, brother's coming home this weekend, wants to play some softball. Can you come over? I said, sure, I'll drive over, because I'm right here in Prattville, and that's not far from Plains, you know. He said, listen, on the way over, he said, be thinking what we can do to beat him, because <laughs> we, nev we never had beat him because all of his men were Secret Service. <laughs> all muscle guys, you know. Well, did and you think of football, a way? Well, I thought of a way, and we beat him. <laughs> so I drove into Plains, I pulled up in the yard and blew the horn, Billy came out and slammed the screen doors. What you got, Clarence? I said, come on, let's go. Where are we going? I said, we're going to America's, going to this college over there. <laughs> so we drove over to America's and uh, we cornered the, the coach said, told him, we, we need him to line up his three best baseball players. <laughs> so we told him we wanted heroes. <laughs> we so wanted Superman, he, right? He said, what are you going to do? And I told him. And he laughed. He said, good. <laughs> so he, he brought in these three boys. I said, guys, I said, listen, all you got to do is enjoy yourself this weekend and play a good game of ball. And I said, uh, if anybody asks you, you all three are couriers for the network. <laughs> to be on Billy's team, you had to be a member of the network. Right. <laughs> we had Sam Donaldson, we had uh, Ed Bradley, we had Ed Rabel and uh, Nelson Benton and people like that, you know. And they were good writers. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Billy, uh, look at me and he laughed. He said, you think this is going to do it? I said, I know it's going to do it. <laughs> all, I said, all we got to do is get one home run. And I said, that's going to weaken them so much they can't play ball. Did you win? We won. <laughs> I was <laughs> catching. And I always caught and Billy would pitch. Unless Billy got too many beers to pitch and then I would pitch. <laughs> but Billy was pitching and Miss Leon had given both the boys uh, a custom-made bat, softball bat, 
They were black bats embossed in gold with their name on them, Billy Carter and Jimmy Carter. And they used those bats in that game. They didn't worry about saving them, you know. And But anyway, um, Jimmy was up to bat. Oh, we'd already been knocking home runs. <laughs> That peanut field didn't had never seen baseball like that. I was a softball, and uh, oh, when we arrived, when we arrived back at the ball field, uh, Jimmy met us and he says, uh, "Where's your roster?" So we had wrote up, written a roster up, you know. We had these three guys on it. And he was reading the roster and he said, "Uh, uh y'all can't use these boys. These are real ball players. They're not for the network." And Billy said, "Brother." That's ABC, NBC, and CBS Couriers you're looking at. If they need any film run to the airport, these boys will take it. That's what the job was. <laughs> if we shot any footage that had to get to the airport, they'd take it. Now, did you make up that job position, or was that an actual job position? I'll never tell. <laughs> but, well, how did uh, President Carter feel about this win? <laughs> well, when, when we won, uh, Jimmy made the last out, struck out now. Cause one of those boys was pitching, <laughs> and uh, and Jimmy struck out and he threw his bat down in the sand there, you know, and he started storming off toward his house. You could see his house from where we were. And Jimmy grew up in peanut fields, and his stride is four foot. Everybody else's is three foot. <laughs> but he would he would walk like he's walking over peanut rows, and he was taken off of the house three Secret Service agents trying their best to walk, walk what they were having to trot to keep up with him. And I looked and I saw that bat in the sand and I looked at him. He was just about at the pitcher's mound. I picked up the bat and I said, Mr. President, Mr. President. He turned around and he says, what is it, Clarence? I said, sir, I know you didn't mean to leave this bat in the dirt. He looked at me, shook his head, he says, you're right, Clarence, give, give it to me. Uh, so I, he knew I wanted to bring it to him. You know? <laughs> so I went running out there. You're looking at the only man that ever chased a president with a baseball bat and, <laughs> and lived to tell about it, you know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I got the bat out there and gave it to him. And I said, uh, sir, I said, since we finally won a game, I said, will you autograph my glove? <laughs> <laughs> and he did. <laughs> <laughs> he did. I've got the glove here somewhere, but but he autographed my glove. That's amazing. Okay, let's talk about something a little serious, too. Uh, one of the most impactful stories uh, for around the world that you covered was the genocide of Jim Jones. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what that experience was like? You didn't even know when you were going there that that's what you were going to see when you landed, right? That's correct. We had no idea. Um, because when we left Atlanta on a chartered jet plane that morning, we knew a congressman from California had been killed, and we knew an NBC cameraman had been killed. We didn't know who either one of them was. The problem was, really, it was double jeopardy for me because my brother was with NBC at the time. I didn't know if he was down there or not. And so uh, we took off in this Learjet and uh, went on into uh, Guyana. Uh, and as we approached Jonestown, which is surrounded by jungles, a river, a little port over here, Port Kaituma, a uh, fishing port. And uh, as, we, as we flew over Jonestown, we saw what looked like blankets laying all over the ground out there. We didn't know what it was until we went all the way across 60 miles of jungle, landed in Georgetown, rented tail dragger airplanes, ones that could land in the grass strip, dirt strip, and flew back. And then that's when we started seeing dead people all around where we landed, as well as on the road back up toward, which was about a quarter mile, a little dirt trail, on the way back into Jonestown. And there's where those blankets we saw were people wrapped in their bright clothing, uh, but they were laying all over the ground. Rarely were any two just blocking each other. There were some touching, holding hands. There were some clutching their child, but they all did. 
and a few had made it into the jungle. Uh, three uh, white guys made it into the jungle. They were the lieutenants, I guess you'd call them, of Jim Jones. They did his bidding. They were standing there with guns at the ready when Jim Jones told his people to drink Kool-Aid um, laced with cyanide. And uh, as they drank the Kool-Aid, of course, it started acting on their body as soon as they drank it. Horrible death to die of cyanide. But uh, Jim Jones would tell them to bring their babes in arms first. They'd walk up there with a baby in their arms. He would squeeze the mouth open for the child and squirt with a hypodermic syringe, Kool-Aid into the mouth and hold it over the mouth and make them swallow it. And then while they're swallowing it, the parent is having to drink Kool-Aid. And um, the wash tub, number three wash tub, was still there on the ground with Kool-Aid in it while we were there. Uh, there was a, a bottle, a medicine bottle on the floor next to the throne. My partner picked it up and it was Quaalude and it was a prescription for Jim Jones. And uh, so I guess that may be one of the things that helped him go into a, a hallucination, hallucination period when he wanted to. But my partner sat on the throne and had his picture taken holding a Quaalude bottle. Wow. That's, that's Lewis Ledford of Atlanta, Georgia. But uh, uh, anyway, it wasn't long before the uh, officials, police, started making all the press leave because more press had gotten in there. Different ones had followed us in there. And, and by the way, when we first landed in uh, Georgetown, we were getting our equipment out of the jet, the Lear, and uh, we looked up and another Lear coming in and landed. And it was my first cousin, Charles Jones, oh, wow. with ABC. And then the third one made the approach and landed. It was my brother with NBC. That's how close the news travel. We all got our own information. We didn't share information. We never once talked about what our assignment was. Of course, we were very competitive and we liked to beat each other uh, and get the best footage. And uh, so when one of us ran, the other one ran because they knew we had a reason to run. But uh, anyway, uh, Larry Layton, we, 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 they put us up in an old British hotel, three stories tall. Water pressure in, <clears throat> in the town wasn't strong enough to reach the third floor during the daytime. <clears throat> so at night when you go to bed, you go in there and turn your shower on and go to bed, and the dripping of the water when it started in the middle, middle of the night, you jump up, get ready, and take a cold shower. No hot water. But you take your cold shower and get waked and ready to go for the next day. Uh, but anyway, that was a little bit of the first trip. I went back down for the second trip. Uh, my partner didn't get to go, and he asked me, he said, uh, get me something made out of gold. Because the flea markets were dirt ground, uh, dirt floor, but they had tables around where goldsmiths were working. These guys are self-taught on making jewelry out of gold. And you can buy the jewelry, you know, and buy whatever. However, you're only legal without taxing to bring over $12 over what you brought into the country in value. And after $12, they start charging a high tax on it. My partner said he wanted something special from down there. I said, what do you want? He said, well, I don't give me something made out of gold. And I just happened to see his belt buckle. He had a big brass. CBS News belt buckle. I said, give me your buckle. He said, what are you going to do? I said, just give me your buckle. He gave me his buckle. And, and I, I had a regular old buckle on mine, so I gave him mine to put on, and I put his on. Uh, that night before we left to go back, I polished it real good. It was made out of brass, so it shined like gold. <laughs> I wore it into the country when it went in. I declared it. This is my gold-colored belt buckle. When I left, they checked me again, you know. Declare everything, put everything out. I see you got your belt buckle. Yeah, I got my belt buckle. 
got in the plane, flew to Atlanta. I gave Lewis his belt buckle. Solid gold. <laughs> wow, like magic. <laughs> Now, you worked with some high-profile figures as far as CBS is concerned. I know Dan Rather, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. Right? Uh, did you ever work with Cronkite or oh, yeah. Scott Pelley? Oh, yeah. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about what it was like working with those personalities? Good people. Scott was a very special guy, very special. And it was always a pleasure to work with him. It, it was, he was always relaxed. He knew what he wanted when he wanted it. And he was just a pleasure to deal with. And pleasure to watch him deal with other people. He treated other people with respect totally all the time. Not that Cronkite didn't, but Cronkite was so many cuts above most people that uh, um, it was hard for him to get a real good interview from them, you know, because they felt like they were out of place being talked to by Walter Cronkite. And of course now Dan Rather, uh, he reached almost that status for a while and uh, of course he ran into a problem with uh, producers and uh, they wound up uh, getting him in deep trouble uh, as far as Bush was concerned when he was running for president. Uh, which um, most of that was lies because uh, Bush did serve right here in Montgomery. He flew right out, right out of Montgomery and because I knew that because I'm from Prattville. And uh, I had contacts that I could talk to, to to tell me the truth about what went on. And uh, so, anyway, that's all water on the bridge, so to speak. Mr. Clarence, quick question. I don't want to interrupt Jamie. You told me a story one time about how you put a tape together in the middle of the desert. Well, it was, it was in the middle of the, the, it was crossed up on stories there. Oh, okay. the, the middle of the desert was repairing my recorder because uh, it had slung a wire off the head on the inside. And I called New York to get another recorder and he said it'll take him a week to get one to me. I said, you care if I work on this one? Because it was all union. He said, do what you want to. You can't do anything with it without the right equipment. I said, I want to try it. So I took it apart and took the head off and saw the wire on the inside that needs soldering. So I re-soldered it, put the head back on. Now comes the problem is balancing the head and lining it up perfect so when it spins, the recording heads are the right distance from the tape. So I took a pair of vice grip pliers and I clamped a straight edge on the back of the uh, cabin uh, cabinet uh, and I lined it up, turning the head to where it wouldn't touch, wouldn't touch, and wouldn't touch, and got it to where you couldn't even put a piece of paper between it. But it still wasn't touching all the way around. Locked it down, closed it up, tried it, worked perfect. And I called New York, I told him, forget sending a recorder. <laughs> I said, this one's working fine. What'd you do? I said, well, I just took care of it. I said, I'll tell you about it when I get back. And uh, the, and see, now, the other thing uh, you asked me about was... I can't remember who you were with. It was either... Pete oh, okay. We went into Huntsville, Alabama to cover a boat that had capsized out on the lake and drowned a lot of people in the middle of a storm, a bad storm up there. They sent us over in, uh, again in a Learjet from Atlanta. And when we landed in Huntsville, we landed in terrible rain. And, and uh, I, we had a, a portable phone at that time, it was like a briefcase. And I called the bureau and he said, look, he says the affiliate has all the footage we need. He said, just leave your gear in the, in the plane, just bring your recorder in the case, that way it won't get wet, and uh, go downtown to the telephone office. We've made arrangements for you to feed out of the telephone office, and you can feed to the net. I said, okay, so we went down there, and I opened the recorder up, put it out, and got it wired up and everything in the telephone office. This guy came in from the affiliate up on the mountain. It's almost an hour drive to get to the affiliate from downtown Huntsville. And, uh, he walked in and he handed me a cassette. And I looked at it and I looked at him. I said, that's a one hour format. I can't put that in this machine. You know, nobody told me, you know. And uh, well, that's all I got. And it'd take me an hour to go up there and come back. And I said, give me the cassette. I said, Lewis, strip one for me. Lewis knew right away what I was gonna do. So he grabbed a 20 minute cassette, which is the side I needed to fit in the machine. And he started stripping the tape out of it. 
and he got down to where we had a, a three or four foot end on the beginning and on the end, and he cut the tape out, just threw that tape away. And meanwhile, I had prepared the other tape. I had pulled his tape out of the, the, the one hour format and cut it, and I took a scotch tape and taped the ends together and took a pencil and stuck in it and started winding, and I'm winding it up, and Sam Donaldson walked in with ABC. He said, what are y'all doing? I said, we're getting ready to feed. He said, well, I'm ready to feed. Get out of the way. I said, uh-uh, don't touch my gear. <laughs> that was taboo. You didn't touch another man's gear. Right. And uh, I said, don't touch my gear. I said, I'm about through editing, and I'll have it ready to go. You're editing? You're not editing. What, a pencil? I said, well, hang on a minute. I thought I'd do it to him. <laughs> so I raised that tape up like that, and I looked at it. I said, there it is right there. And I wound a little bit more, and I said, now I need a little more picture of that. And I went, there it is. And I wound that in, cut it, taped it on the other end, stuck it in the machine, and played it. Played perfect, no problem. <laughs> and uh, But however, the affiliate guy says, there's a better shot of the boat than that. I said, really? I said, let me, I picked up off the floor now, and I looked at his tape again. I said, wait a minute, here it is. I cut again, wound it in. Sam Donaldson said, you're crazy. He, he's looking at that tape, you know. And it just so happened I looked out on it, and that picture was there of the boat. And Sam Donaldson still wondering today how I saw picture on videotape. <laughs> I told him, I said, Sam, you just got to be good. <laughs> So of all the dangers, adventures, journeys that you've been through, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and sometimes even the fun and, and the exciting, um, what made you keep wanting to do it and go back into it and, and go a, another uh, assignment every time you were given one? Now, now, there were times when you wanted to hang it up. There were times when you wanted to just put the gear on the ground and let somebody else come get it. Uh, but you had more pride in your work than that. And you cared more about what you were doing than that. And, and to be good at it, you had to be available. If you couldn't be real good at it, just be real available. Uh, because a warm body, when needed, is 10 to 1 over one that's not there to do the work. And so uh, uh, availability and it's a big sac sacrifice, but availability is what it's all about working with, especially the network. And because if you're not available when they want you, you're no good to them. And they'll just call somebody else. And what made it all worth it? <laughs> it was good pay. <laughs> but I enjoyed it. I realized it was an education that I wouldn't have had otherwise. It taught me more about life in those years than I could have ever learned in any university. However, I did go to many universities, uh, although it, I was on the other end of the learning curve uh, from the ones that were already there, uh, because I was covering a new story about them. And so it was hard to realize sometimes how much power the camera actually had, but the camera had a lot of power. There's a lot of times the camera saved me from getting hurt. We were in Miami during the riots down there, and one of our camera crews had gone out to get pictures of a riot going on next to a bar. And they came out of the bar and they swamped them and uh, brought them a wash tub after they beat the camera all the pieces. They brought a wash, t wash tub out for them to put their camera in, and they beat the crew up. And they came back into the uh, affiliate station where we were, and I was looking at them, they're all bloody and bruised and I said where were y'all and they told us so I, my partner said you want to go I said let's go so we drove right on down there and our rental car was a black Cadillac <laughs> we had a black Cadillac wasn't a limousine but a big sedan we drove up right down in the middle of the intersection stopped got out of the car started getting our gear out the guys at the bar were looking at us they thought we were crazy and uh, this one leader from, come on, let's go get him. And uh, it came out there to us and started pushing us around in a minute. And I turned the camera on the leader. I said, let me tell you something. If you want to get your story told, th this is the way to do it. Talk to this lens right now. Tell me what you think about the way you've been treated. 
then we'll see what we can do. That guy was cursing and carrying on about how the police had been treating them and all that and mistreating them and everything. And, and he finally ran out of steam and the rest of them were cheering on for him, you know. And uh, I said, now, if you want this to get on the air, you better make a trail for us to leave here. Y'all get out of the way and let these boys out of here. Move out of here, let them go. <laughs> Smart thinking. <laughs> that didn't take university education. I'm you telling that. you, you gotta think on you gotta think on your feet. <laughs> now, uh, I need to get a picture one time of Billy playing golf. I'm gonna tell you a little short story here. Okay. And um, Do you want to get some cutaways while we talk? Yeah, I, that's what I'm doing. Yeah, we're all doing this. It's perfect time. Thank Billy. You. Billy, Sam Donaldson, um, Ed Bradley, uh, Nelson Benton, and a bunch of other reporters were playing golf at the Plains Georgia Country Club. It's a little 18-hole um, golf course in the, in the woods right outside of Plains. And uh, so I drove down, pulled up. And they were already playing. There was about eight golf carts, gasoline-powered golf carts. And they were just all over each other and yelling and screaming, you know, and drinking beer and all that stuff. And <laughs> Billy had on cowboy boots, Bermuda shorts, a Western shirt, and a Western hat. <laughs> and uh, I pulled up. When I first pulled up, uh, they were headed for the ninth hole. They were halfway through. And the ninth hole was up on a flat where when you're on the flat and looking, you can't see what's below. It's a blind shot. We could hear them, but we couldn't see them. And Lewis said, what are we going to do? And I said, well, think about something, man. We've got to slow them down so we can get assembled. Lewis said, I know what to do. He went over. There was a five-gallon bucket of golf balls sitting over here by the golf uh, shack. And uh, there were practice balls. And Lewis grabbed that bucket and threw them all on the green where the hole was. He said, let them find their ball in that. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so they came up and they started looking around and they started cursing and carrying on. And, Where's the ball? What? Well, I don't know where my ball is. <laughs> and meanwhile, Billy said, Clarence, I thought you were going to get a picture of playing golf. I said, well, I'm ready to do it now. So we got started getting our gear out. CNN cameraman. I forgot his name, but anyway, rolled up, started getting his gear out. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to shoot what y'all shoot. I said, you're not going to shoot what I shoot. He said, well, you can't stop me. I said, well, I cannot <laughs> shoot. That means you got to go shoot. Right. If I not shoot, then you're going to get in trouble because I got special permission from the owner of the golf, golf course and Billy. I said, you hadn't got either one. So I said, let's put it back in the car. We put it in the car and drove off. Lewis said, where are we going? I said, watch. Went around the corner and we turned sharp into a sawmill road, went back toward the hole 18, and we stopped down in the woods, got out, walked over to the edge of the golf course where they couldn't see us, and they're coming over the hill. All these yeah, golf carts chasing each other and everything. And Billy's ball had hit close to the edge of the woods and bounced over into the woods. And we were within 12 feet of Billy's ball. But Billy was having his celebration, and, and uh, he walked over and put his club in there, and he started raking the ball out. And they were yelling and carrying on. and said, Billy, you're going to shoot. Well, I'm trying to find my ball. He was raking it. He raked it over into the fairway, and, and he took his foot, and he teed it up with his foot where he could hit it. And, and then Billy hit. <coughs> he reared back and hit the ball and duffed it. It went into the woods, deep into the woods. And Billy said, golly. And this, this somebody yelled, Billy, you going to hit or not? He said, just a minute. Put his hand in his pocket, pulled out another ball and dropped it <laughs> right on the fairway. <laughs> and I'm shooting all this. He dropped it on the fairway and, uh, and he hit that ball with ease and they went on. Lewis and I were laughing our head off. We got back in the car, took off for America's Georgia, and uh, we went into the uh, restaurant, and they had a big round table that was the coffee table for our, everybody. Yeah. And we sat down, and we were drinking coffee when, when the golf crew got back, and Billy yelled, Clarence, I thought you were going to take pictures. 
I said, I did, Billy. <clears throat> he said, I didn't see you. I said, well, you weren't supposed to. I said, but I saw you. And he said, hey, y'all, Clarence got pictures of us playing golf. Let's go to his room and look at it. I said, oh, Billy, not now. Let me talk to you first. <laughs> He said, he said, no, y'all, come on. He said, nothing wrong. We won't, we won't see it. I said, okay. <laughs> Went to my room, unlocked it, and I had a machine set up and the TV in there and everything, you know. And so I popped that cassette in. I was playing it. And they were sitting on the floor, on the bed. They were everywhere, and they're leaning in the door. I started easing myself over to the door. Got just outside the door where I could lick, peep in. And all of a sudden, the crowd got quiet and they were watching Billy tee that ball up out of his pocket. And uh, Sam Dawson said, Billy, damn it, give me my money back. <laughs> they had bet like $20 a piece. You know? <laughs> and uh, Billy looked at me, Clarence, and I took off running. <laughs>